Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, I was there for the standing ovations earlier, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. The post-lunch AI talk. That is worth a standing ovation, right? Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you guys for coming today. It is a privilege to be with you. And we're going to talk about how we can leverage AI as nonprofit leaders to grow innovation and impact. But I want to start with a story. There was a new technology that came out, and people were really worried about it. They were worried that they would lose their jobs. People were worried about the spread of misinformation. Artists and writers were worried that it would water down the creative arts. Uh, people were worried that business, unscrupulous business people would take advantage of others using this new technology. And ultimately, there was a lot of trepidation. Does anyone know what technology, by the way, we're talking about? <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> and the movable type printing press. In 1452, Johann Gutenberg uh, released to the world this brand new invention. And there were a lot of concerns about this brand new invention over the coming 100 years, by the way. And if you think I'm making that up, by the way, uh, this is not the case. You can actually do research. Um, through the decades, as the printing press began to spread, people were, had every one of the fears that people have today about ChatGPT or about, I heard, the internet or television, right? <laughs> so the thing I want us to take away is, by the way, every one of those fears did come true. People did lose their jobs. There were jobs that were eliminated related to the printing press and the printing industry. Misinformation has been spread using the printed word. So when Amanda mentions writing a book, talk about an intimidating on many levels, but also just to say, how do I put truth and goodness into the world and not just words, right? And so all of those negative things, negative outcomes, actually did happen related to the printing press. But at the same time, I would argue, over the last 500 years, a lot of good has happened. And people have been lifted up, and they have, been, they have learned, and they have grown. Information has been spread. People have been connected because of the printed word. And so it is something that I think we can look back on in light of today and see how this technology might be used for good. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do, I want you to get to know your neighbors, because one of the things I love about coming to events like this is the chance to actually connect and walk away with a relationship. Somebody that you can call in six months when you're going through something and you've had a conversation at the conference and you say, hey, uh, can we just chat? I need to talk about something real quick. And so... What I want you to do is we're going to do this. It's going to be fun in this room, but we're going to do groups of three, okay? And I want you to discuss this question. You're going to have about three minutes. And for those of you online, I want to see in the chat your reflections on this question as well. So we're going to see what the online chat has to say as well. Um, but the question is this. What do you think about when you hear the phrase <laughs> artificial intelligence? This is an <laughs> invitation to authenticity and vulnerability, by the way. And so we're going to just take three minutes, and I want you to get in little groups of three, right where you're sitting, and just discuss. What do you think about when you hear the phrase artificial intelligence? And make sure, if you haven't met, to introduce yourselves while you do that. All right, go for it. Thank you. 
Okay, you've got about one minute, so start wrapping up. One minute. Okay, all right. So this is the fun part where I have to get your attention back. Hello, everybody. I hope you met somebody new. I hope you exchanged information. Make sure you do that by the end of this session. Um, I would just love to hear from the group. What are some things that you heard in your conversations? What just what came up? What uh, what do you think about? O originality? Is that what I heard? Right. With the printing press, yeah, somebody had to write the words that then were produced. Yeah, okay. What else? Confidentiality. Confidentiality. Guys, we're going to try oh, to we're gonna do so that they can hear us online. Yeah, sure. What else? Sometimes it feels like people are cheating because some of us are doing all the work in the writing, and I feel like it's being regurgitated to other people. <laughs> so, I don't know. Well, before, that word scared me. It, I would think about the evils of AI, but now it is a time saver. It has made my job so much easier when I have to do research and just different things that I have to put together. Time saver. What else? Anything from the chat? What? Hackers. Hackers. Yeah, yeah. Anna. Anna. Just a couple from the chat. We have a lot of responses from the chat, but we have a few. Bill Atkins says he thinks of augmentation. Augmentation, Going yeah. alongside you to do mundane tasks. We have some that say false intelligence, uh, programming, innovation, efficiency. A few are kind of unknown about it. Sure. But collaboration, and just a lot of intimidation, fear, but seeing its utility. Okay. Yeah. All all good. I mean, all true. You know, we talked a couple of us talked to the front here about artificial. That's not exactly the best maybe naming. I'm a marketer by trade. And I'm like, who who in 1956 decided that was the term we were going to use, but and then we have lived with it since, right? We have the intelligence side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so we're going to talk about how we can leverage artificial intelligence today, but I think we need to place it in the context of a category that I think of and is the theme of this conference, which is innovation. Okay? Um, and if you think about innovation, one of the mistakes I think leaders tend to make when they think about innovation is they think of innovation as only the latest and greatest, the newest shiny object, the whiz-bang thing. Whether or not, by the way, it's actually helpful or useful or made a positive impact on the world, right? But I think we can learn a lot more about innovation by studying history and by looking back to other times in history when humans have faced situations with technological change, for example. And uh, so I believe that innovation is ancient. I believe we can learn a lot from people like Leonardo da Vinci and Johann Gutenberg and Filippo Brunelleschi and these people from ancient history as much as we can learn from today's bright minds because we can look back at history and see what actually stood the test of time, what actually uh, uh, missions and purposes stood the test of the time. The other reason that innovation is super important is because innovation is essential. And the reason innovation is essential is because every organization, every nonprofit, every institution, every church uh, is going through disruption. 
And the graveyards of history are littered with organizations that have pioneered one way of doing things but failed to transition to the next model. And there is a difference between your mission and your model and the way that you accomplish your mission. There's a difference between your purpose and your practices. And organizations that innovate understand that their mission and their purpose don't change, but their model and their practices do change over time. I think Chick-fil-A, by the way, Amanda and I were just talking about it, is a fascinating case study in an organization that has a rock solid purpose and mission, and but their model and their practices, how they actually execute that mission over time, changes. Um, every organization is somewhere on this curve. Every institution, every model is somewhere on this curve. It's either in its infancy, it's in an early growth, mid growth, slowing, plateauing, or decline. This is just the circle of life, right? The good news and the reason that innovation is so important is because innovation enables us to create new S-curves, new life, new opportunities for growth. So I want you to hear whether your organization's five years old, 50 years old, or 500 years old, your mission and your purpose doesn't change, but your models and your practices do need to change to accomplish your mission. And so it, uh, AI has an element to do there. As Amanda mentioned, I did found a company and I love working with nonprofit leaders to help them imagine a future that could be. And so Imago Consulting is what I do on that. But I also am blessed to write a weekly column on innovation, trend spotting, lessons we can learn from Chick-fil-A or from Blockbuster, but also information we can use to help lead our organizations and grow them, uh, especially in the area of fundraising, recurring giving, things like that. And uh, as Amanda mentioned, I do co-host a podcast called the Purpose and Profit Podcast, where we have leaders from businesses and causes on to talk about what are the lessons we can learn from each other. Anyone uh, really appreciate what Jeff had to share this morning? Jeff Anderson, incredible. And one of the lines he said in there was literally, the intersection of purpose and profit and the lessons we can learn from each other. And so our show is all about the lessons that we can learn on both sides of that. So today, how can we leverage AI for impact and growth? Well, I'm gonna give you a few principles and then I'm gonna give you six specific ways to utilize AI in your leadership, in your organization uh, this year. First of all, artificial intelligence is a tool, right? Like. You've heard this, like it's, it's just a tool, right? I think that this is a bit of a misnomer and not maybe the way you think I, I mean this is a misnomer. I think the way we talk about artificial intelligence is very abstract and very high level and we even refer to it as artificial intelligence. Like, do you use artificial intelligence? Do you use artificial intelligence? What does that even mean, right? No, artificial intelligence is a set of tools, okay? Does anybody remember the first time they went on the internet? Yes. Do you remember that moment? Like I was, I was uh, younger, uh, I was 95 probably, and I remember, yeah, I heard, the, I heard the beep. That was good, the modem sound. Um, we all know, well, we don't all know that sound. <laughs> Let's be honest. Uh, but uh, yeah, 95, and my sister was in college in Southern California at the time, and she got the internet because she needed to do research or something like that. And I remember saying, hey, can I, can I try that? Can I use the internet? And she was like, sure. So I logged on, and uh, the home screen looked a little bit like this. Does anyone remember this? Uh-huh. And I was like, nah, I know enough. I've read enough about this that this is like these like chat rooms and stuff. I'm going to go to one of those web browsers and I'm going to try the like real internet. And I remember just staring <laughs> at the blank browser. Like, what do I do with this thing called the internet? Well, basketball, favorite sport, uh, big fan of uh, the NBA. And so I was like, well, they, maybe they have a website. So I typed in nba.com. And sure enough, 1995, they had a website. And I remember thinking, this is so cool. The internet's awesome. It's amazing. Uh, I don't know what to do next. And so I just logged off and moved on with my day. I think the way we talk, talked about the internet in 1995 is how we talk about artificial intelligence in 2024. We say, do you use AI? That's like saying to somebody today, do you use the internet? <laughs> and it's like, uh, what time period are you from? Like, did you get hit in the head, right? 
no, we talk about, oh, I use social media, or I'm on TikTok, or I use YouTube, or I'm doing online banking, right? We talk about the function and the tool we use. We don't just talk about the category, right? So I look forward to the day, and I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see that day where we're not talking about artificial intelligence all the time. We're talking about Grammarly. Do you use Grammarly? Does anybody here use Grammarly, by the way? All right. We got some AI early adopters. Congratulations, everybody. Um, Artificial intelligence is also not neutral. And this comes from an author that I really appreciate. His name is John Dyer. Um, and a lot of people talk about, oh, the tools are not neutral. Well, any tool that has ever been invented was first shaped by humans, but then the tool thereafter shapes the humans. And so if you think about a simple tool that most of us don't even think about as technology, the shovel. The shovel is technology. And when you use the shovel, you can dig a bigger hole than you would have without a shovel, but it will change you over time. It changes your hands, it changes your back, right? So our tools do change us. They are not neutral. And so uh, technology is shaped by its human creators, but thereafter it shapes its human users. And we need to be conscious and cognizant of that when we use any technology, whether it's social media or artificial intelligence or print media, by the way. And uh, there are two fundamentally types of artificial intelligence when we talk about AI. There is general AI, and there is what is known as narrow AI. Now, general artificial intelligence most experts would agree, 99% of experts would agree, A, doesn't exist, and uh, B, is a long ways off. However, most people tend to think of general AI as this guy. Does anyone remember this guy? Does anyone know what movie this is? This 2001, Space Odyssey, yeah? And, and this was HAL 9000. This was before my time, to be clear. But I do love the fact that my name's Dave, and uh, HAL, the AI, refused to open the pod bay doors for Dave. Uh, this guy was a little bit more my speed. I remember being in third grade across the street at the neighbor's house, and he had a copy of this new movie called The Terminator, and I knew I wasn't supposed to watch it, <laughs> but I did, and I was terrified. Uh, this is not the AI we're talking about today. The AI, 100% of the AI we're talking about today is what is known as narrow artificial intelligence. In other words, it is a tool that is designed to accomplish a very specific task. Now, it can do that super impressively. It can do that, honestly, in some ways, better than any human could, but it is a narrow task. Specific example. We, uh, some of us will have one of these friendly Alexa devices in our, uh, in our homes. I won't name the other one because everyone's iPhones will go off, <laughs> including my watch. Um, but my children, every morning, I have two girls, 10 and 13, I hear from their bedroom, Alexa, what's the weather like today? Yep. We were at uh, um, dinner a couple weeks ago, and my 10-year-old says, Alexa, how many, how many teeth do children have? Because she had just lost a tooth. So of course she's going to ask the white sphere in the living room, right? If you were a kid in your bedroom growing up and you were like, Bob, what's the weather like today? Like your parents would be worried about you. <laughs> but our, my 10-year-old and 13-year-old are growing up in a world in which it's completely normal to just ask a question to the open air <laughs> and get an answer and expect a, co a coherent response. But at the end of the day, Alexa is a narrow artificial intelligence. What it's doing is it's listening, takes a prompt, takes your words, turns it into text, submits it to a large language model, then takes the response and reads it back to you. So it's super impressive, don't get me wrong, but it, at the end of the day, it's a narrow artificial intelligence. Uh, Generative AI, anyone heard that term in the last year, maybe too many times? Generative AI is all the buzz, but basically what generative AI is a subset of artificial intelligence that is focused on generating content. And so the best and most prevalent example is a large language model, which we'll talk about in a minute, that can generate text, but you also have images, increasingly audio, sound, and video. Um, and so it's basically using massive amounts of existing examples of data, so like words or pictures, and then it is able to then generate uh, content based on a prompt. A couple more definitions and then we're going to get right into it. Uh, large language models, those are basically within the text-based world. A large language model basically takes 
typically trillions of words and pulls them together into basically create, and the key here is human-like content. A large language model is primarily concerned with sounding human, and it is so impressive over the last year, that does not necessarily mean it is right, by the way. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and there are some lessons I think we can learn about how to best use a large language model. And the last definition we're gonna use is machine learning, which machine learning is really the foundation of artificial intelligence and has been around since the 1950s. And that is basically using computer systems to learn and adapt without following explicit instructions. A friend of mine said it this way, typically, in the olden days, we would use technology and we would basically say, here's the rules, like here's how math works, and then we would give it a bunch of data and we would say, hey technology, what are the answers, right? You put in rules, you program rules, and you put in data and you get answers. Artificial intelligence and machine learning doesn't work that way. Artificial intelligence takes a lot of answers and a lot of data and then it determines and discerns what the rules are. And so it can detect patterns that no None of us could, could detect. I would be fascinated if we had the time to, to share if there are organizations here that are using program data to, for example, predict outcomes that no normal statistical human-driven model would be able to predict, but then we could use that data to actually get better outcomes. At the end of the day, that has a lot of definitions, at the end of the day, all artificial intelligence basically does one thing and you can summarize it in two words, and that is artificial intelligence is about predicting outcomes. It's taking a lot of data and it's saying, here's what I think the next step is, or that, that next step might be a click on an ad, that next step might be the next word in the sentence, right? Has anybody noticed how when you use like a chat GPT, how it like writes out the answers and stuff? I used to think that was like a clever design trick to make it feel human because it was like, oh, it's writing an answer to me. And then I learned about this and it's like, oh no, it's literally every word in the sentence. It's predicting the next word in the sentence. It's going back to the question and the word it wrote so far and it's saying, what's the next smartest <laughs> human sounding word to say right now? And it has gotten so good because of all of the data that it's been fed to be able to do that. But at the end of the day, you can boil all of artificial intelligence down to predicting outcomes. There's a very helpful metaphor that I learned a number of years ago and has really helped guide me as I have thought about AI and technology today. And that metaphor is if you think of technology up into the 20th century through the 1900s, uh, technology has primarily been around equipping humans and augmenting human ability. So my example of the shovel, which yes, by the way, that is a technology. With a shovel, I can dig more holes. Or with a tractor, now I can then dig even more, right? And so technology has uh, historically been about augmenting human ability. In other words, technology in the 20th century has been technology as a power tool. So it takes human capability and gives humans the ability to do math faster because I have a calculator or a computer now or I can, I can do that. But fundamentally, I'm just augmenting human ability. Technology in the 21st century, increasingly, and especially with artificial intelligence, it's much more like thinking about technology as a coworker. Technology as another person on the team, or candidly with a set of tools, multiple people on the team that we can work with to help get work done. Now, it can also do things that no human can do, uh, like I said, in terms of detecting patterns and some of those things, which is super important. But this has been a super helpful tool and, and metaphor for me, and so I hope it is for you. So what we're gonna do here for the balance of our time is we're gonna, I'm gonna share six different ways that you can work with artificial intelligence as a coworker. Okay, and then we're gonna have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end, especially if you're on the chat. Make sure you're chatting questions as you go. Would love to hear your questions. Okay, let's dive in, and here are the six right up front. Um, AI is an assistant, AI is a brainstorming partner, AI is a media buyer, AI is a copywriter, an editor, designer, and research partner, okay? And then I've got a tool, tool that you'll be able to download that has six more ways you can use AI, so stay tuned for that towards the end of our time. So first, AI as an assistant. How can we use AI as a personal assistant? Well, the first place, and about half the room is already doing some of this, 
and that is for proofreading and email communication. Now we're gonna talk about actually writing and editing a little bit later, but I don't know about you, but I work with some people that really should have somebody read their stuff before they send it out, yeah? We know that, okay. Well, just get them Grammarly, uh, and you'll be, you'll think, you can thank me later. Um, Grammarly is not the only tool, but I would argue it is the best for this. And it goes far beyond just simple autocorrect, which is helpful, to, to not just grammar, but to actually coherence, like, I don't know about you, but I've tried to communicate a lot of messages at times, and I'm like, I cannot, fail. like I have written six sentences here, there probably needs to be one, but I can't quite figure this out. A tool like Grammarly will actually underline it in green, and then you can click on it, and it says, here's a better way of saying that sentence, and then I'll read it to make sure it's still going to communicate the idea that I want to communicate, but it's a super helpful tool. And so uh, you can also use a tool like Grammarly to actually help auto start an email response. So if somebody says, hey, would you do this? There's actually, you can click on the little Grammarly tool and it says, would you like to say yes or no? And then, and then it'll actually expand on your response and you can even use it to start an email response. So super helpful. When I started, by the way, um, at a, a marketing agency that worked for nonprofits 20 years ago, we had an entire proofing department. Did anybody work with a proofing department? We had like six or seven people that their job all day was to be handed documents that they would then proofread and line edit. And we all learned all the cool little, you know, uh, stat and, you know, all the different, uh, you know, uh, characters that you learn. Doesn't mean that proofreading is not still important for human capability, but um, you can use, yeah, that's a job that is harder to keep now um, when you have AI. Another way you can use uh, AI as a personal assistant is for calendar management. I don't know about you, but the biggest pet peeve I have in organizations is if I have to schedule another meeting with five people and figure out everybody's calendars and, oh, this person's not available on Tuesday, right? Well, you can use a tool like Calendly to automate how people can select times. If everybody's using Calendly, then it can actually look at everybody's schedules and just say, oh, you're all available next Tuesday. Super helpful. Talk about time saver. Um, for a little more of an advanced use case, there's an application that's called Motion. Now, I haven't used this personally, but I do have friends that have used it. And what it, Motion does is you give it access to your calendar, and we're gonna talk about what, what you give access to AI in just a little bit. Uh, but you give access to your calendar, and it can look at your task list and your calendar, and it knows, it learns how long it takes you to do certain tasks. So I write that thank you letter once a month. That takes me 90 minutes or an hour or whatever. And then you put your task list and it automatically fills your calendar with, uh, and helps you plan projects. It knows what meetings can't be moved, it knows what meetings can be moved, and so I have friends that will use it for project management within their organizations. So another use. And then the last use I think is super helpful is for transcriptions and summaries. I did not grow up in an era where it was cool to go to your assistant and say, can I dictate a memo to you? Like, I've never done that in my life. But thanks to Fireflies, I dictate ideas and memos all of the time. And um, so you can use a tool like Fireflies or Otter.ai or just two of the tools. There are many that will, that will record and then transcribe the words that are said. So if this is an interview, for example, when I do research interviews, I'll use Fireflies um, to be able to, to record. And then the AI can then take that transcription, just like an Alexa, and then it can do an automated summary. So it can take a 30-minute conversation and say in one paragraph, this is what they talked about. It can then say, these were the six action items that were discussed. Now, half the time it's wrong because we just talked about an idea and we didn't decide on an action item, right? But it could be super helpful. Now, you'll notice an asterisk here. The asterisk is you need to be very careful about what data you are feeding to AI and then specifically within the tool, what is that platform's terms and conditions? So for example, ChatGPT has been mentioned a couple of times. There is a free version of ChatGPT and a paid version. One of the differences is that the free version's terms of service mean that anything that you enter into the prompt field can then be used. It's added to the trillions of other words that then can be used to train the model. 
Okay, so a couple things. Number one, I am a writer, but I don't, I'm under no illusions that I'm gonna write better than AI, so I don't really care if my writing goes in there, but I do care if proprietary, personally identifiable information goes in there. And so I would never use a free tool that has that in their terms and conditions um, with private, personally identifiable information. I would either use a paid tool uh, for that or just not use it at all. And this is a personal preference thing, by the way, but I do not record every meeting that I go to. I know some people are in the practice of doing that. That's, that's fine, um, but it, there, were, there are a couple things there. Number one, I don't think every meeting that I'm ever in needs to be recorded, because not that many words need to be added to the world. Um, but then also, it changes the nature of the conversation. Even if the technology is secure, it can change the nature of the conversation when somebody feels like, well, this is being recorded. Can I really be honest here? Or is this gonna be played back <laughs> at some point later, okay? And so as a practice, I personally only record things that are like, it's an interview. Hey, are you okay if I record this? Uh, because then I can actually pay attention to the interview more and less on transcribing, right? Stuff like that. But I also wouldn't underestimate the tool for just personal memos. I will brainstorm, I'll be driving to the airport, brainstorming a new article or a new thing that I'm working on. And then sometimes I will then just feed that in and just say, hey, what, what is the outline of what I just talked about for 15 minutes there, you know? And that could be super helpful. Okay, AI is a brainstorming partner. This is one of the, the uh, most fun uses, I think, honestly, of AI, particularly of large language models like ChatGPT. And that is to just brainstorm on any topic, right? So a specific example with writing is, you know, help me come up with 10 engaging hooks, so the opening of an article, to draw readers into an article about six ways to engage AI as a coworker. So very meta there. But any time that you need to brainstorm ideas, whether it's a campaign that you're working on or a program that you're working on, I did a, just a quick example uh, last night. I said, I'm organizing an upcoming charity auction. Help me brainstorm a list of key activities and things to do organized by how many weeks out. And it's a fascinating, I can, if you want, I send me an email and I'll send you the full response, or you could just plug that same question into ChatGPT and see what you get, which by the way, you will get a different response because that's one of the things about large language models. But the cool thing about this is that you're just learning to get comfortable with asking the question, okay? My children have no problem. They ask Alexa stuff all the time and I'm like, one, is she gonna know that? Or two, is that even relevant? But uh, those of us that are a little bit older, I think need to get used to this idea that I can just ask the AI a question. You, have, has anyone heard of the term prompt engineering? That's been, oh, you gotta ask the question just right or whatever, which is cool. But also, just pretend it's a coworker and say, hey, how would you ask a coworker a question? Like, assume that the coworker's an expert, it may or may not be, but assume it's done a million charity auctions and say, hey, coworker, help me come up with a list of things I need to do for the charity auction. Now, would you then just copy and paste that and that would literally be your list? I don't recommend it because it's not an expert and it's probably gonna miss things, but I bet you it comes up with some things that you haven't thought of. So it's a wonderful brainstorming partner. Number three, AI as a media buyer. Um, so for anybody that's used uh, uh, Meta or TikTok or any of these platforms for advertising, you know that the classic ad adage in advertising is how do I get the right message to the right person at the right time in the right channel? Well, AI can help power that reality and help that across at scale. One of the most common ways, and it's been around candidly for about seven years now, uh, but people don't think of it as AI, is called lookalike audience building. And what lookalike audience building is based on is you say, okay, here's my best volunteers, or here are my best donors. I securely um, uh, upload that to say Meta, for example. They anonymize the data, but they're able to then match other people that share traits in common with the people that look like the people that you work with. And so it's a way to use big data, big data to actually be able to find new audience members that share those traits. And these are not like, I know most people are thinking, well, what traits? Like where they live and or how old they are or if they've been involved with that cause? We don't know. That's the crazy thing about big data is there's probably 
hundreds or thousands of variables that in and of themselves make no sense. But together, it comprises the kind of people that uh, we want to be searching for. So lookalike audience building, every major advertising platform enables some form of lookalike audiences. And then another piece is then automated bidding. So um, the very first digital campaign I ever worked on was for Union Rescue Mission in Los Angeles. Shout out Union Rescue Mission, they're amazing. Um, I grew up in Southern California and so served at the mission and then one of the first organizations I got to work with professionally was Union Rescue Mission. Well, we did an ad buy, this fancy digital ad buy with the Los Angeles Times. Crazy idea, right? We spent $30,000 and I remember getting the report back and being so <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> $30,000 and a million impressions on the website and two donations. So I was like, man, I wish I would have known that about $30,000, $29,900 ago, right? So with automated um, bidding, you can use artificial intelligence to say, I only want ads that are going to perform at this level or better. And so you can actually have the algorithm every day, every hour of every day, every minute of every day, modifying your bids automatically based on the outcomes that you're trying to create. Okay, AI as a copywriter and as an editor. So we talked about AI as a proofreader. So let's talk about copywriting. So um, how many of you here in your job have to write? whether it's a memo or a thank you letter or an appeal letter, right? Uh, I have to write in my job as well. You can use uh, AI in two ways. You can use it for copywriting help as well as for editing help. Copywriting would be, hey, help me with an opening to a letter or even just give me a first draft of a letter, something like that. Um, editing is more, I've got the content and now help me edit it. So a couple tools um, you can use for creation. Um, you can use a tool like ChatGPT or copy.ai or jasper.ai. Um, are, are good tools to say, hey, I'm writing a campaign, these are the themes, this is the outcome, and then help me get a first draft going. Um, here's just a super simple prompt just to play with, by the way. I'd encourage you, if you want to try this out, just take a picture of this and unplug this into your friendly large language model of choice. Say, help me find a fundraising email appeal for, name of my organization, use an appreciative tone or whatever you want to prompt it with, each $30, $19, $100, donates, does what, right? Because that's what you would need to do in a normal fundraising letter. And then our mission is as follows, and I'll have to just copy and paste the uh, mission of the organization from their website and just stick it in there and just see what happens. It's incredible. If we had time, I would do it. It just blows people away. We don't, but I highly recommend just doing that as an experiment. Um, and then editing is a godsend because that goes beyond like grammar. So for example, every week I mentioned I write the wave reports, about 1,200 words. So these are essentially articles on how leaders can grow in innovation. Uh, fortuitously, about two weeks ago, I wrote a wave report on Chick-fil-A and innovation. Well, once I had done my first draft, because I don't use uh, you know, copy.ai to do a first draft, I do a first draft, and then I do my own, oh boy, that was pretty bad, let me do that, make that better. And then the third time I copy, I have uh, Grammarly review my draft. And you can see it's very small, but up here in the corner, you can see there are 80 suggestions on my draft, and it gave me a score of 78, which I hate getting bad grades, so uh, so we got to make that better. Um, and then what it does is it color codes the recommendations by correctness, clarity, engagement, delivery, and it literally says this is a these are what we recommend. It takes me about less than ten minutes to run through those eighty suggestions. So it's not like heavy. And honestly, I reject about one third to a half of them because it's a stylistic choice. So, okay, I I know that's not the right way to say that, but that's the way I say it, and people like my voice, I'm told. So we're going to go this way, right? So you don't accept everything, but you use it. So think of it like a coworker, right? So I'm working with the coworker. It's maybe given me a draft of a paragraph that I was really struggling with, or it's saying, hey, you might be able to say this more clearly if you say it this way. So very powerful tool. All right, we're on the home stretch here. Um, AI is a designer. Um, who here uses the tool Canva? 
for design. All right, well, did you know you have an AI design tool at your fingertips? Somebody and I were talking um, just yesterday about this. You can use um, Canva to prompt to create you first draft of, of creative. So for example, I plugged in a, a query, and you just put it in the search box, which is kind of weird, but um, I said, create an Instagram post for a workshop on May 14th with Chick-fil-A on, quote, leveraging AI to grow innovation and impact, and then it, it added the word templates. And sure enough, I've got 20 starter Instagram graphics that I can work with. All of them are uh, not perfect. <laughs> Um, but then what I did was I just uploaded the, the logo, and it created all of these versions just with the logo. I can click on any of these and use that as a starter to then modify. Like, ooh, I, the link was missing, or I wanted to add, make the headline bigger or whatever. But it can be a great way to just start with a bunch of stuff, decide what's a good starting place, and then modify from there. Um, you can also use AI for presentations. This is a tool called Gamma. Uh, Gamma is a tool I experimented with. There's another couple called slides.ai and beautiful.ai. And, and by the way, the download that I'm mentioning has all of these links, I'm just realizing. I'm mentioning a bunch of tools, so it's in the download. Um, and I took an article that I wrote last year on um, adapting to the future and, and lessons we can learn from the Industrial Revolution. Um, again, 12 to 1500 word article, and I said, please create me a presentation. And in about 40 seconds, it created a 20 slide presentation version of my article with like key headlines, key ideas. I had this whole thing about how the loom, like the old industrial loom, changed the way that, that people created fabrics, right? And it was smart enough to be like, all right, well, then we're gonna include an image of a loom here. I didn't tell it to do that, right? So it broke down my points um, uh, very sort of artistically, which was super helpful. All right, home, last one here, and then I've got some final thoughts here. The AI as a research partner. Um, so AI as a research partner also comes with a big, big asterisk, and that is, uh, that you need to not assume that what the AI is telling you is true. Yeah. Um, so you have to be very careful when using AI for research. Um, here's a fun query. Uh, what is the world record for crossing the English Channel entirely on foot? which is somebody being a little cheeky with the AI because I hope they knew that that's not possible. Um, but the AI very confidently responded, well, Dave, the world record for crossing the English Channel entirely on foot is held by Christoph of uh, blah, 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 of Germany who completed the crossing in very specific time, very specific date. This is, you know, and then all this stuff about the English Channel. Well, that's obviously not true, right? And if you look at it, some of the dates and times aren't the same. It wasn't the same guy, right? Now. The, the people who are making the tools of AI are working at being more, it, knowing when it's being asked a factual question and trying to be factually accurate, so they are trying to improve. But there's a reason I recommend uh, Microsoft's Copilot specifically when you do research. And the entire reason that I recommend that is because of these little bubbles in the chat or in the response. So for example, I specialize in helping nonprofits do recurring giving. And so I research a lot the subscription economy and how that's transforming the way donors behave. Well, I used uh, chat, uh, or sorry, uh, Microsoft's Copilot, and I said, what are the top trends in subscriptions today? And it gives me things like, oh, did you know that the subscription economy has grown nearly six times faster than the S&P 500 over the last nine years? But the reason I use it is because of the little one there. And each of those facts is backed up with a link to where it got that fact. And so I can then click on the link and actually learn that this is a true, this does exist, but this data is like three years old. So it's, a, it's out of date information. But if I wouldn't have used the query, then I wouldn't have found out that that thing existed and I wouldn't have clicked on the link. And so I don't use uh, tools like this for research just to trust the tool, but to then point me in the direction where I might actually find some really interesting information. I think eventually most of our Google searches are going to be this. We're not looking for what are the 1.2 billion websites that have this word on it, but just answer my question and point me to the couple best sources where that information exists. Okay, 12 ways to leverage AI in 2024. I, uh, for time and for the post-lunch crowd, I'm not gonna go through all 12. And by the way, this is the only image in this entire presentation that some of you were probably already wondering was generated by AI. 
because I said, I, you know, give me an image that talks about technological innovation in ancient history, and it was kind of a fun image. I thought it was cool. All the others are just, you know, photographs that I've taken. But um, so if you are interested, here are the 12. So we talked about, like I said, six of those. And then the next slide, you just keep your camera up. I'm just going to put this up, because this is where you can actually download examples of all of the 12. So um, this will give you all of the links that we talked about today, then the plus the other types of ways to use AI. And it's about a 20-page PDF, so nothing too complicated. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to go back to the, I'm going to go back to the 12. So you can grab that. Oh, I'm going to get out of the way. Excellent. This is being recorded as well. OK, oh, sorry. OK, just some, some final thoughts. And I know my next final thoughts, so I'll leave that up for a minute. Um, AI is a means, not an end. It is a tool. It is not going to accomplish your mission for you. It, I think, for literally everybody here, could help you accomplish your mission, but it is not going to do your mission. It is a means, it is not an end. Um, at the same time, human collaboration is vital. Every example I used today was me working with the AI to get ideas or to experiment with things or to do things a little bit differently or to learn a new way of doing things, but it was always in conjunction working with the AI. And I think to the extent that we become comfortable with that, that concept, is to the extent that we can be really successful in utilizing and experimenting with these tools. We're going to go to Q&A in just a second here. Last thing I want to share is I believe we were made to innovate. And I think, you know, I started this talk very purposefully because throughout history, people have felt exactly how you feel right now. In some days, in some days overwhelmed, maybe frustrated, maybe scared, um, maybe optimistic. But all of the feelings throughout all of human history have existed and don't just exist today. And so I believe we are made to innovate. And that part of that innovation is understanding there's a difference between our purpose and our practices, between our mission and our model, and how we can leverage that. So when you think about ChatGPT next, just remember Johann Gutenberg in 1452 and all the people for a hundred years after him that were like, I don't know about this thing, like, I don't know, you know, and, and what possibilities um, uh, that entails. Thank you, guys. Okay, so we're going to do some Q&A. Amanda has a mic, so she's going to come around. And so just raise your hand and she can uh, get you the mic and then we'll, oh, and by the way, I am on LinkedIn. If you, if you want to be LinkedIn friends, is that, what do we call those? Just LinkedIn. Connections. That's cold. Let's be LinkedIn. friends. <laughs> okay. Um, how do you discern if you're using chat GPT or something else to prompt or, or the one that you use to create the presentation? Yeah. How do you know that you're getting content that isn't like completely duplicated from somebody else's work where you're actually inadvertently plagiarizing something? Sure. I was looking at the photos and images that it generated. Well, are those somebody else's copyrighted photos or do you have access to those because you're paying for that service? And Yeah, there are some tools. I'm uh, Unfortunately, I'm blanking. There's a tool that, like, for example, teachers are using um, to look for generated, not only copy, you know, copyrighted content, but the AI generated content. And I think there will be increasingly be tools for that. Um, I don't, even though I mentioned, like I'll use it for pieces of content. Like this paragraph I'm really struggling with, or the opening to this letter, give me 10 ideas. And then 80% of the time, I'm not then using the content, it like inspires or it's like, ooh, that's a good start, but let me edit it. So that's that's part of it. And I candidly, I think there's a journalistic integrity thing to that too. Even if it's completely original from ChatGPT, that it's not original to me. Um, but I think it's a it's a legitimate question, a legitimate concern. And especially for people that are feeding it, right? Right, who are feeding it. Yeah. So where is all this data being held. I know there's an area in um, in Atlanta, this huge data center. Yeah. And does that have anything to do with like where this stuff is 
like housed? Uh, I mean, so I mean, there are a couple. Asking the right question. Well, sure. There's there are a couple. I mean, technologically, and this is the edge of my digital uh, understanding here. But technologically, there are massive data centers and massive. Uh, the data centers is much about the processing, the computer processing power. Because when you like get this super quick response, it's literally looking through like trillions of pieces of data, which just blows my mind. And so these companies, particularly Meta, particularly Microsoft, uh, Amazon, basically have had to build these massive facilities to be able to make those queries uh, possible. And they'll, just like every computer thing, they'll get smaller and better over time. But the amount of data we're putting in is, is pretty tremendous. That's interesting because the data center that I'm thinking about is next to an Amazon um, yeah. A huge factory, of, not a, not a warehouse. Yeah. So. No, a lot of the power we think of it as like, oh, I just queried the computer. And it's like, yeah, there's a <laughs> 100,000 square foot computer warehouse somewhere that's answering that query, by the way. So when you, you know, have to pay twelve ninety nine a month for that, remember remember that. What's the line about like if, if, it's, if the product is free, then you're the product? Like, so, question. Um, I loved your slide on the S curves and that, you know, you know, growing to dying, but then with tech, it can continue to have an S curve. Um, for, we've been around for like 40 years um, and we've plateaued on our like new business. Mm -hmm. um, is there software that you've been really impressed with of like uh, reaching a new clients? Uh, you know, for us, it'd be like church leaders. Hey, subscribe to our resources and it'll help grow your attendance, things like that that you've been impressed with? Yeah, I mean, I think lookalike audiences is, is kind of um, boring as that maybe sounds to anybody who's used them because they've been around for so long. That is that is one of the best ways because you're essentially saying, here's our best prospects or people that we're trying to target. Help me find more of those. And I will say in more professional settings, like I said with LinkedIn, that may not be as good on the pastoral side, but there are platforms that then specialize in, in convening people and you can utilize tools for that. Beyond that and using it for the content creation that then creates the kind of attraction, that's, that's what comes to mind. Yeah. Do we have some online? Yes, we have one question online from Mike Clowers. Dave, thank you for your work. The magic of effectively working with AI is prompt writing prowess. Would you happen to have any tips for effective prompt writing? Effective prompt writing. The main tip is to just release the <laughs> feeling of fear and, and like I have to be perfect and I have to talk to the robot in the right way. Like I remember learning with Google, like, oh, if you said and, that changes the query and, you know, you had to learn that. The AIs today are getting so much better at basically taking your normal natural language and turning it into a question. Now, just like you would talk to a coworker, I wouldn't say... Hey, uh, Felicia, um, I have a fundraising event coming up. What should I do? <laughs> well, I, okay, uh, I have some follow-up questions, right? But if I was asking Felicia, thank you for being letting me pick on you, this question, I would give her some details. I would say it's in three weeks, and it's about this, and we have this going on. And so to the extent that you actually give it real detail, that is to the extent it'll be helpful. Just like a coworker would be completely stumped if you just came to them with some really ambiguous, "Do magic for me, please." You know, and they're like, "I, you know, I don't, I don't do that." So that the main thing is talk like a human and actually be specific. Like, share what you're really thinking. And I find that sometimes another pro tip: um, ChatGPT and the other tools will have like a, an audio version on their phone. I have a friend that literally has entire conversations with ChatGPT on the road. Like he'll be driving, he'll be like, so I'm thinking about this, and what do you think I should do there? And then, because it's audio, it, like Alexa, will then r give him a response back, and then he'll have, a, and then he'll ask it another question, and have a conversation with his worker in the car, <laughs> which I still haven't done, by the way. I did with my kids once, just because I was like, but I'm like, that's, all, that's, that's the kind of new kind of, especially for those of us that are a little bit older, that's the kind of new muscles we need to learn that to our kids is like, well, of course you would just ask the sphere in the living room any question that you have. So, all right, any other questions? I think we're right almost at time. One more question, yeah. Thank you. So my question is more about 
kind of human behavior in a sense. I'm very excited about AI. So I'm the person on my team that's like, let's do all the things yeah. right now. How do you inspire, encourage, create an atmosphere where other people in the organization are excited to try you know, new tools? Because their job might be the one yeah. that's getting eliminated. So how do you create that atmosphere where we're learning together and it's exciting and we're not afraid that you know, we're walking ourselves out of a job. Sure. Everybody adapts at different paces. I heard a quote yesterday. It's a little harsh, so just it's not my quote. But it was, AI will not take your job. Who will take your job is somebody who learns how to use AI. So if you want to be a little harsher, you could do that. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm more of a just, just try it. I, I have a degree in the internet, by the way. My degree is literally called Web and Information Technology. We didn't call it digital back in my day. And I remember people would say, like, how do, how do I learn how to use the internet? And I would be like, I don't know. Like, I went to school for it, but y y they don't teach it. You just have to do it, right? And so I always try to give people, this was too many hooks. I mean, this was so for you to, like, pick what's one thing I want to try. Just if you, by the way, if you don't use Grammarly, just start there. Because then you'll be like, this is awesome. And that will start to warm you up to how you might be able to utilize AI. But the first time somebody takes like that fundraising letter prompt and, and writes it in, there's some version of fear that they may feel. But it's also like, oh my gosh, you mean I could then have that as a first draft or I could you know, take parts of that and use that and restructure it for my own use. I, I don't do this kind of writing, but a lot of you probably do interviews with people that are in your programs that you're working with and then you want to tell their story. I would love to use it with a transcript of an interview and say, here's what I really appreciated about so-and-so that I interviewed. Help me write a first draft of their story and remove this, these personal details or whatever, to replace these personal details. I, honestly, when I put it into the prompt, I would remove the personal details. I usually just change the name or I say, help me respond to my friend who wrote me an email that was not very nice and I need you know, a good response, right? Like, you don't have to put the personally identifiable information in there, um, but to use it for tools like that. But it's just helping people to see it. And so one of the things I love doing up here is to just show people. I wish I could have shown you more hands-on. Um, but it's just to be like, oh, OK. Like, oh, that's what it is. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's OK. So great question. Thank you, guys. You've been great. I think we're at break time. Yes. Let's give him a warm applause, please. That was awesome. Thank you so much.